Okay. Well, welcome everyone. So I learned about Git pre-commits at the OSPO workshop over the summer, and I thought it was really helpful. So I thought I would do a quick example run through of how you set them up and talk some based on my limited knowledge. I've done it twice now. So if it doesn't work, don't be too surprised. Um, but yeah, I think that they're useful. So I guess an overview of what pre-commits are. So these are hooks that you can put into Git so that before you send something to GitHub, it performs some actions on that something. Um, and you can put in different things, like there are different packages that you can have that do different things. So one that I'm gonna talk about is like for formatting. So if you have multiple people all writing Python code or something, and you want them all to use the same formatting, but some people put more spaces in, some people leave lines between things and put more notes in, this will go through and fix all that into the same format so that all your code always looks the same. Um, but it, there's also like linters that you can have run where it'll look for errors. There's one that you, looks for any privacy things. So like if you accidentally put your API codes into it and then you were gonna put it, push it to Git, it would stop you before letting you push it. And I've done that before I've put my API codes on Git and someone wrote me and they're like, are you sure you want your API code there? <laughs> and I was like, no, not really. And then of course, Git has the history. So then it's really hard to get rid of like every revision that all had that in it. Um, so can having you, these- Can you get like delete? Well, I didn't have that many done. So yes, I could, but it was a lot of work. <laughs> And I did change the API codes case it didn't actually work. And um, <laughs> well, I had multiple things. It was an open AI code and I was using it. Uh, and at the time they only gave you yeah. one. Now that you can have API codes for each of your projects, but that came later. Um, so it can do a lot of useful things that can keep you out of trouble before you push things and make them public. Um, because once they're public, it's hard to roll them back again. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate, and hopefully it'll all go as planned. Um, so this is just my terminal in my computer. So I'm just going to do all this locally, though you could obviously do this on a server as well. Um, let me make this bigger. Let's see if that helps. Um, so I keep all of my Python projects in a folder called Python projects, very creative naming. Um, and so I wanna go ahead and create a virtual environment for this project so that I keep everything off to the side of my main Python. Um, so I'll just create a virtual environment and I'll name it demo coders commit. And give Python a second. This so that's good. Um, and then I will open that up. Um, demo coders commit. Um, so when you create a virtual environment in Python, it creates a bin folder, and in that bin folder is the activate function. If you haven't done that before. Um, and so now that will activate my virtual environment. So everything from here on out then will be in this environment separate from my main Python. And you can see that if you haven't used virtual environments before by it puts it in parentheses at the beginning. Um, so now if I do a pip install of pre-commit, which is just a Python package, it will just install that within my virtual environment. I'm also going to install something called black, which is what I'll use later um, to have it available for doing the format checking. Some of the hooks you have to download something for, some of the hooks you don't. It depends what the hook is doing um, for your Git project. So now if I do a pip list, 
I can see in my virtual environment, I don't have much, but I do have um, pre-commit and I have black as my two packages that I'm actually going to use. So now that I have the virtual environment set up, um, I'll go ahead and I'll deactivate it because I'm gonna do some work outside of it first and then come back to it. So now I'm back in my Python folder um, where I now have that new, so if I do a list, you can see I have demo coders pre-commit is the folder that I want to work with. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I should go into it first. Um, so I'll go into demo. Pre-commit. So now I'm in that folder. And what I want to do is I want to go ahead and download a Git repository um, so that I can clone it. And then that's what I'll edit off of instead of creating everything from new. So I'll just grab the URL from here. And I will do. So I'm just going to clone that repository into my new folder that I created. Just like that. So this is actually if I. So this is just a small Git repository. It has like a readme file and one Python file. And what it does, not that, that this is important for this part of the presentation, but it downloads something called um, Philosophy Archive, which is a preprint server for philosophy philosophers, and they preprint their research there. And I have it run a daily using a Git action. So every day it downloads that and then it sends it to me. So I have a list of whatever new philosophy archive papers come up. And those are the only two files though in there. Um, so now if I do a list, you'll see that I have the um, fill archive daily. And in there, now if I do a list, you can see it just has a readme file, a Python file. Oh, and it has a requirements file. That's it, it's a pretty simple um, set of folders. So I'll actually, I'll go back into it. And within there, then I'm going to go ahead and make a file that will tell the pre-commit what hooks to use when I do a pre-commit. Um, so somewhere in your Git files, you have to tell it what to do when it does this pre-commit actions. Um, so first I'll create a file. So I'm in now that Git directory that I just cloned, and I'm going to do um, create a file called git pre-commit or pre-commit.config.yaml. So I'll start it and then now I'll edit it. I could have done all that probably in one step, but this makes it a little easier to follow along. And there we go, it has the start. Hmm. I wonder how, oh, I must have had the file in there already. When I was pre-testing, I already created the file. So it downloaded with the clone. So it was already there, but now here it is again. So this is what the YAML file looks like to get um, started. It tells me like I can have repos within there that I'm going to use for my hooks. And so the first one I'm going to use um, is going to be this hook for the black down here. So like here is the one that connects to black, which does the formatting. This first one um, is kind of like a standard set that it checks that your files all end and it looks for trailing white spaces. Um, and I got all of these, of course, just by copying what others have done. Or you could ask ChatGPT and it would tell you all of these as well. Um, 
So yeah, and I can add more. So if I um, go to my side file, I can go ahead and get in here then. And I can put some more in. So there's one called Flake 8, which uh, looks for syntax errors in your code. And then there's one called Detect Secrets, which does exactly that. It looks if you're posting secrets. Um, and then there's one called Bandit. I'm trying to remember what Bandit even does. Maybe I put a note about it. Um, oh, it looks for security problems. So like if you have any security issues that in, within your code that it could identify, it will stop it from happening. So I'll save that. So then what you have to do is once you've set up your pre-commit, so you've told it it has a package called pre-commit and you created a YAML file that tells it which hooks to use in that pre-commit, you then have to do a pre-commit install so that it knows to start using what you just did. Ah, and of course, now I run into an error. Oh, maybe I have to go up a level. Let's see. Well, I thought that too when I did it the last time, and it's not an, it is a hyphen when you go to there. Um, even though the package, when you look in your list, when you do a pip list, it shows as an underscore. Um, I'm trying to remember how I solved this last time. I'll do the easy thing. Copy all this, and I'll just ask ChatGPT, why is this not working? Yes. <laughs> About 90% of what you say. Uh, error message, what is this mean? And most of the time it's pretty good. Or how do I do this one weird specifically GD stuff? Like, oh, I got out of my virtual environment. That's why. I'd forgotten about that. I deactivated to do the Git part. So yeah, let's go back now. <clears throat> Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, so do this. Okay, so now I'm into there, and now I'll go back into my correct folder. Okay, let's try this again. So pre. Command install. Okay, so now it should be installed. And so I can do a pre commit run and I'll do all files. Oh, it says. An error occurred, git failed. Is it installed? Are you using the git? Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe I stop to go in one more folder. Let's see. So, yeah, so I wanna go into the fill archive underscore daily probably. Okay, try it one more time. We did not go into the direction. Uh, okay. Okay, so it did install because that's where the Git is, not outside of there, so. So now if I do a pre-commit run all files, it 
So you can see what it's doing. So this is just doing like a pretest before I made any changes. Um, so it checks that there is a YAML and did it, and it didn't have the right end of files. So it fixes those. Um, and it goes through each of the things and tells you what it did and what it fixed um, kind of line by line. So now it's installed and it is apparently running. So now what I can do is, um, so let's say I go into a file and I'll, um, I'll do a list. So here are my files. I'll go into my main Python file. And so I can put in something like, I'll do something kind of bizarre. I'll put in a bunch of extra spaces, something like that, which you normally would not want in your code. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I just saved that file now with the things. So if I do a git commit, um, oh, I have to do my git add first. Git add, fill archive, and then I'll do a git commit test of changes. Oh, yeah. Pre-commit configuration is unstaged. Oh. Oh, I see. So let me. Um, commit that as well. And then it should work. I made changes to two files and I hadn't committed the one as well. So it's wanting that. Okay, so it went ahead and did that for the YAML file. And now if I go back and add that, Hmm. Oh, I went to that wrong one. You're right. Okay, so it should have gone through and corrected some of these things. So now let's say if I go to back into the file, before I even send it up to get all went as planned, it should have fixed. Oh, yeah, there. So you can see where it took the spaces out from the part that I didn't have formatted correctly. And it will fix other formatting issues as well. Um, and this one formats, I'm using black for formatting, but there are other formatting options. There's a popular one called Ruff, R-U-F-F which just has slightly different formatting than black. So it's kind of whatever one you want to have, whatever formatting changes you would want. But the nice thing about it is that it will be consistent then. So that was one of the things that we learned in the OSPO workshop was like to use this so that all of your files are consistent in their formatting, just it makes it easier for other people to use and of course, if you're doing this in an open source project or you're working with a team, then again, everyone can use the same formatting or at least it will look like everyone did in the end. They could do anything, but it will format it all for them if they're all using that same package. Um, I looked up and there were probably about like a dozen different hooks that people recommend using 
for different types of projects. So if you have like a Rust project, there's a whole set of like hooks for Rust projects that do different things for you. Um, but all in all, I found it pretty useful to um, have it in place so that every time I send something to Git, it does these checks for me so that I don't have to think through and like, oh, did I post my API code accidentally? <laughs> which is definitely something you don't want to do. Um, the security ones are probably more useful, like if you're posting to code that you're going to run on a server somewhere and you would want to make sure that you don't accidentally introduce security flaws into your server. Um, this project, again, is really small. It's just the one file. It's like 50 lines of code total. So there's probably no threats. I'd have to work hard to figure out what threat they're right in. Um, yeah, that was it. That was the whole setup and running. It's pretty simple once you kind of get into the flow of it. Um, and then it will just run anytime you make a commit from now on. It will just check it first before it allows you to push it to your origin. Do you copy this to every new project, basically? I'm starting to. I'm trying to get better at that. Um, yeah trying to figure out kind of like what is your project startup process, I think is really helpful. Otherwise you have to back end and do it all at other points. Um, but I'm trying to get better at it. So like the first one I learned was always create a virtual environment. I, after <laughs> messing up my Python several times, I finally figured that out. That's always the very first step is yeah. create a virtual environment and then start everything after that. Um, but that's one that you have to learn the hard way, I guess, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, my, yeah, once you've gone down the path and you haven't done it, it's really terrible. Like I run a server and I didn't create virtual environments when I first started doing it years ago. And that Python is all messed up. But I don't want to dare take it all down because it'll break like five different websites and all of that. So I just keep it running, but it's risky. Like every new project I add is a risk that I'll break my Python. And then I'll have to recreate it from scratch again. Um, has anyone else used pre-commits? Well, I know you have because you were in the workshop with no. us. Oh, you didn't. Oh, I thought you were doing it. In the no, workshop I have, too. I don't have any projects yet, so uh, I think I should do it. Seems like good practice. Set it up and just forget it. No. Yeah. What about survey ten? Is that? I mean, you're collaborating on that. Yeah. Never use this for it. I mean, this is this is the first time I've heard about this was just a few weeks ago when someone brought it up and you said, "Oh, I'm gonna talk about it." I never even thought about the concept of speaking. Um, but also in a project like Survey Down, I'm like even I feel like more hesitant to use it because I'm just gonna probably break something. <laughs> like I don't know, like there's a bunch of people contributing to it, so I'm afraid of that's more of a reason to use it. Uh, maybe it is. I don't know. Well, actually, that's a good question. So yeah, when you users. yeah, when you have different users, you know, you're saying it it helps like you know align people, like it's so you don't have the tab event rewards and, and things like that, but mm -hmm. Aren't you forcing one way on them? Like, because when they do their their fetch, they're, it's going to say they have to go back and change all of that. It's going to change that. Well, it changes it before it goes up. So it would change whatever they did to the standard format. And then when they, next time they sync, it will be in the standardized format. So yeah, if they really don't like the standardized format, then, um, but again, it's most, it's small things more than yeah. major things um, for the formatting. My guess with the survey project, it would be helpful to like anything it has for security issues, because as your project grows enough, yeah. then you want to, you probably won't think through all of the different security problems that might come through your code. Um, now, I don't know what they have for our hooks, like, I was only really looking at Python hooks, but I assume there is a whole set of R hooks too, where people who. Or we have to build it. 
<laughs> or you have to build them. So you know if that's a CISA, the banded project is like a CISA banking project. I don't know. Um, we can look it up. So let's go to. Do they have a this philosophy of secure by design, and that would be somebody in it along the way. Let's say. In our case, there's not a whole lot. The only security parts are like sending data to a database. That's it's a survey. So you're collecting responses and sending to a database. So it's like one small section that can really involves that. We don't really need any other. And, and I'm reviewing every pull request anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. We're we're a little behind on on getting all of that perfect, but like good enough and we just have a giant thing at the front that says hey this is still an early stage project so we can <laughs> that's, that's our our waiver our disclaimer for people using our platform yeah i'd be very curious to see you implement some of this to see yeah you might you know be like wah 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 like warning warning yeah you know, check this out and, and give you a whole bunch more work to completely understand <laughs> Well, especially because I mean, maybe maybe there's a difference in the community too. That like the R developer community is, I don't think it's definitely smaller, like way smaller than yeah. I have here. And so when you go across the the you know different training and background people have had, most people in R are like probably more than half of them are coming from non CS directions. Like they they don't have. They weren't taught. They didn't take a security class. They didn't take a programming class. They just like figured it out. Like, oh, people like me. And people who are like software engineers are going to look at our stuff and go, wait a minute, why did you build it this way? This is the way it all works. Um, so there's a smaller group of people. And so any barrier I put to like people contributing makes it even harder for me to want to. Right now, it's just like, send me anything you want and I'll, I'll take a look at it and see if it works. <laughs> and so there's no, there's no like screening or anything. <laughs> I just look at it and screen it myself, and I'm like, okay, at least that gets people engaged with it. It may not be the best code, but it's working, and we'll clean it up over time. And that's kind of our approach to you know, making it work. Because I'm, if if this was a bigger project where it really was like hundreds of contributors, okay, then this makes a lot of sense. Like, there's going to be a lot more structure in how you contribute to the project. Right now, it's like me and Pink Fan, a couple other folks, you know, and like a guy in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> who found it a few months ago and thought this was cool awesome. um you know so we're for a small operations thing but I, I this yeah this i feel like makes more sense when you've got structure that you where there's a, your court like the thing you saw two weeks ago it was you know coordinating across all of these different people contributing that's yeah you, need, you, you would have to idea. have something like you this need, then yeah you need there's a reason because... why things like this are there but yours might get there before you know it. At that point, I'm going to be like, and you can take over. <laughs> yeah, no, it's big bonds. You're the maintainer for life. <laughs> this is the worst thing about open source development is you become the maintainer. You're like, oh no, what happened? This was so much fun. I now I'm a maintainer. this little thing, and now I have all these responses. Apparently, I'm a maintainer of like five different things now. I didn't sign up for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Um, oh, my.